Sam, he want to look good. <laughs> Play uh, uh, hide, hide and go seek, and they'd say, "Ready or not, here I come." Uh, one of these days, Jesus is going to come back, Amen. and ready or not, He's going to come. Amen. And I pray that you're ready. And uh, this is called, Amen. He's coming back to Earth again. Because if you hadn't had the Word of God, you'd have never knew that you were guilty, and you'd never known the way to to become innocent. You'd have never known that you was in need of a Savior, and you, you would have never known who your Savior was. So the Word of God was important for our salvation, and it's just as important for our sanctification. And it's just important uh, for us to be able to accomplish the goals that God wants to accomplish in our life. We need the Word of God. If you don't care, turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, we'll be reading 11 through 14. I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, but uh, God has given us a series of messages over the past several weeks. And... Uh, I never knew that they was going to be, uh, you know, a series of messages. Uh, 
I knew after the fact, after God had told me what to preach, and, and uh, you know, I'm real slow. Mom always said I was slow. <laughs> but I figured out, I mean, God, you just give me a series. I wish I'd have known that for, beforehand. That way I can say, you know, hey, I'm going to preach you guys a series. But that would probably cause me to be prideful. But he blessed me to uh, preach a series over the past several weeks, and it goes hand in hand with uh, with love, goes hand in hand with revival. And uh, the messages that God has given me and, and give Jeremy and, and even Will, for those of you guys that heard Will uh, here lately, just everything ties in together. And today, I'm sure that next Sunday will probably go right along with this, but as far as, you know, the past few Sundays uh, have went, these are all going to come together today and we're going to make a full circle. Now, I can't hardly draw a circle, but we're going to make one today with the Word of God. And here lately we've been talking about the ways that the adversary would come in and attack our local church and how we overcome those. Uh, well, a lot of times the adversary may not be able to get you this certain way, but maybe he can get you this certain way later once you forgot about what happened before. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because this is exactly how the adversary will attach, uh, attack our little church next. And I want to overcome that battle, don't you? Well, I got some news for you. We can't overcome it, and we're going to need the Word of God to do it. How many wants our church to continue to grow? How many wants to see people continue to be saved? We've had a lot of people get saved here lately, and God's moving, and I don't want that to stop. And what we've seen thus far isn't even the beginning of what God's going to do. He told me a long time ago that we're going to see things we've only read about. And I believe that's coming. Uh, now the past couple messages have been on suffering. So there may be a lot of suffering through these times, but we're going to see a lot of God's glory through these sufferings. And we've got to be ready for that. Got to be ready for that. And the past two mess Sunday morning messages has been preparing us for the sufferings. Now today we're going to do a, a summary of everything we've learned in this series of messages and we're going to wrap it all up and show you what our church is going to look like. You guys excited about that? How many's enjoyed the series of messages that God has given us? Man, five hands. Thank you guys. How many's enjoyed the series of messages that God's given us? The Word of God is awesome. We'll read Hebrews chapter 5, 11 through 14. Now don't get disheartened when you hear these verses that we're going to read. Because I'm not talking to you through these verses. This is a warning for the future. So don't think that these verses are you because they're not. We're in a good place right now. But those of you who are able, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when, the, uh, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And there become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Would you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, God, we just come before you today. God, so humbled. God, but we come before your throne room of grace, and we come boldly because of what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done for us, God. And we understand through your word that we have access to you through faith in Jesus Christ. And God, we come because we're in desperate need of you. We're in desperate need of your word, God. And our community is in desperate need of you, God. There is people that are hurting. There is people that are struggling. They are little children that are suffering, God. And there is absolutely no reason that they should suffer 
because you are here and you are here in the form of your church, God. And God, we cry out to you today for the ability and the desire to go out and reach those who need rich, God. For if there's anything lacking in our community as far as the gospel is concerned, it's because we are lacking in your word, God. So pour your word into us today so that it could change our hearts, so that we can be fully equipped to deliver your gospel to those that are broken, to those that are lost, to those that are hurting, to those that are outcasts, to those that are homeless, to those that are hungry, God. Equip us for your glory, God. Send us out to be your ambassadors, God, and equip us today through your word. God, man can't preach your word. They can't teach your word. They can't understand your word. So push me to the side. And Holy Spirit, you take control of this message or this teaching or whatever you would have it to be, God. And you edify the church today. But God, use me to do it. And I'm humbled that you do. I'm not worthy. None of us are worthy of your grace and your mercy, but you give it to us freely. And for that, for that, we're so humbled today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to spend a little time in a summary of what we've already learned, and I won't take much time. But here's the thing. There's some people in here that has uh, uh, missed a sermon or missed two or missed three, and it's important that we get caught up somewhat. So if you've already heard this, uh, then bear with me. And you know what? You should be willing to hear it again because it's easy to forget. And if you are concerned about the well-being of the church, you can sit through stuff that you've already heard so somebody that hasn't heard it can hear it. So we're going to do a summary right now. And I'm going to ask you today, is there anybody mad at anybody else in here today? Are we mad at each other today? 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, 1 through 4 says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto carnal, but uh, or as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as those, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Is there envying, or is there any strife in here, or is there any divisions in here? Are we over this? Are we past this thing? Now, it's easy for the adversary to come in and try to attack you with this again, and it's going to happen, probably day in and day out. But you recognize it now, don't you? And you recognize that this is not of God, and that this is a carnal thought on your behalf, and you need to get in the Spirit. So we're past this, ain't we? I'd like to think that we are past this. Is anybody in here today mad at yourself? You mad at yourself? If the devil can't get you to be mad at your brother and sister, then he will try to cause you to be mad at yourself through condemnation. Now we know that Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk in the Spirit and not after the flesh. So if you feel condemnation in here today, and you are upset with yourself, if you have stumped your toe and you're like, Oh man, I'm not worthy. Look here, none of us are worthy. The only thing that makes us have any value at all is Christ in us. So therefore, when we are walking in the Spirit, we don't feel that condemnation. Amen. But when if you are in here today and you're feeling condemnation or you are mad at yourself, you are walking in the flesh. Are we over this? Is anybody struggling with this today? Because this is the second way that the adversary can uh, neg negatively affect the church. He can take us out in a big group by causing us to be mad at each other. But if he can't do that, then he'll pick us off one at a time through condemnation until the church dwindles down to nothing. Once, once condemnation sets in, now you are not only upset with yourself, but you are capable of becoming jealous and being upset with everyone else. Ever been there? 
It happens. Now, through you walking in the flesh and feeling condemned, if you don't give up and leave the church, this is what's going to happen. You stay in the church and begin to subconsciously compete with every other member of the church, and eventually you start a faction. You remember we talked about factions in Bible study. It's a small group within a larger group working to obtain power overall. So if this happens, if the devil is successful in this attack, now our church looks like a bunch of politicians. Now how ugly is that? Do you think a church resembling a bunch of politicians is going to lead anybody to Christ? Do you think we could change the community? Yeah, we can change it. But it won't be for the best. Now if you overcome these two attacks from the adversary, here comes the next. We've been walking in the Spirit. We understand some simple truths. So now God puts us to work in our personal ministry of reconciliation. And it is not comfortable at all. Not comfortable at all. It was not comfortable for Christ when He began this recon reconciliation uh, process. You think it was comfortable for Him on the cross? You think it was comfortable for him to have his beard plucked out and be spit upon and mocked and the whole time he had the power to stop it? Do you think that was comfortable for him? Uh, the, the, the ministry of reconciliation, uh, the personal ministry that God has given you sometimes uh, can become uncomfortable. And for those of you that may miss a lesson or two, that, that's what this is about right now. I know some of you guys already understand this. This is the last two Sunday mornings we talked about this. But reconciliation is the process by which God and people are brought back together again. Uh, we were separated because of God's holiness and man's sin, right? So it is impossible, we know, for God not to judge sin. So through Christ's sacrifice, our sins were atoned for and God's wrath was appeased. So we understand reconciliation. Uh, so through a faith response to the gospel of Christ, uh, this replaces a relationship of wrath and separation from God to a relationship of peace and fellowship with God. And when Christ was reconciling the world, it was very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. The wrath that we deserved was on his shoulders. Every sin that you've committed was drove into his hands through those nails. Every transgression that you would, uh, would make in this life was drove down into his head through the crown of thorns. Everything that you wasn't, he took your place on the cross. And He gives you the ability to be reconciled to the Father. And not one moment of it was comfortable in the flesh. But we know He went to the cross joyfully. Joyfully. And this leads us to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So now that we are ambassadors, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We all understand that, don't we? We understand that. And our ministry is sometimes very uncomfortable. Has anybody ever experienced that? That your walk with Christ got uncomfortable. The reason being is you've been given the same ministry that Christ had. He handed off this ministry to you. You remember when he said greater things you can do because I go to the right hand of the Father? It's not that we're greater than Christ, but there's more of us. 
and He's in each and every one of us. So we can lead more people to Christ, or He can use us to lead more people to Christ because He's in each and every one of us, and He's given us all the ministry of reconciliation so we can do more things. And that was His plan. Not that we're better than Christ, we're nothing apart from Him. And without Him, we can do nothing. But He chose to uh, dwell in us, the indwelling Spirit, which we'll be learning about tonight. But He chose to come inside us and live and work for us, uh, work through us, for what His ultimate goal was, which was to reconcile the world. And this ministry in our lives becomes uncomfortable. As Christ humbled himself as a servant and suffered the cross, we humble ourselves as servants, and sometimes we suffer too. Now we'll go uh, in the past a little bit, and we'll bring up some other stuff that some of you may have missed. There's three reasons that we suffer in this life. You ready? Not all of it is because we're a Christian. Well, it's all because we're a Christian. God cares for us. And when we are adopted into the family and He is our Father now, we also get His discipline. But a lot of it we bring on ourselves. But that's okay. There's three reasons we suffer. One is for the purification of your character. So you may have brought yourself into a situation. So God is going to clean you up through it. And we suffer. You understand that? Number two reason we suffer is God is purging us so we can produce more fruit. You may be doing good, and God says, okay, I'm going to make him even greater. So he may purge some things out of your life so that you can produce more fruit. These, both these things are very uncomfortable. And number three, we suffer just because we're Christians. We suffer for Christ's sake. And all three of these are uncomfortable, so we must use our comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. For us to be able to go through these sufferings in life and handle them appropriately, we must be walking in the Spirit as we do them. Now, when we get this part right, when we suffer, we won't allow the adversary, the adversary to use this against us, but we will be successful in our personal ministry of reconciliation. And it looks like this. You ready? This is the text that we use the past couple of Sundays. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 8 through 11, if you're writing this down. This is what it looks like when we walk in the Spirit and we handle sufferings correctly. So we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. You see, if we're walking in the flesh when we're troubled, then the world sees that we're troubled, but it does not see that we're not in distress. When we're walking in the flesh, when we are perplexed, the world sees that we're perplexed, but it does not see that we are not in despair. But when we handle these sufferings appropriately and we're walking in the Spirit, then the world sees that we're not perplexed. The, wor or the world sees that we're not in despair. The world sees that we're not distressed. The world sees that we're not destroyed. The world sees that we have something that they don't. So now we become successful in our ministry of reconciliation because we start leading people to Christ. They start wanting what we have and that's what it looks like when we are handling this correctly now when we overcome these and we're moving into our new battle that's a quick update quick summary now when we overcome at these nobody's mad at anybody else when we ain't mad at ourselves and when we handle situations in the spirit, we get all three of these right so we are successful in our personal ministry of reconciliation. Does anybody know what happens next? People get saved. Ain't that awesome? Now what is the trouble with that? What could possibly go wrong when people are getting saved? The whole process could start all over. The battle, the initial battle that you overcome is now a battle that you're fighting again. Because when people are getting saved, spiritually immature people are filling up the church. You ever thought about that? And that don't make you no better than them, and that don't make them no better than you. They're just new. They're new at this. So now we're at risk of falling victim to the initial attack. Everybody tripping over everybody else. The adversary comes back to his original tactic. 
You ever seen somebody get saved and then they make a mistake? You ever see the church get mad at them and then them leave the church and never come back again? And then everybody's tripping over that new Christian because they made a mistake and then the church falls apart? You're at risk of this happening again. So this is the importance. You ready? I'm going to use a word that you've heard before. This is the importance of discipleship. Because the adversary will start all over. And you will overlook this. You won't see this coming. You'll be so tickled uh, that brother and sister and cousin and mommy and daddy are getting saved. And you won't see the devil coming in to rip the church apart again because you're so excited. So let's go back to the opening text of Hebrews chapter 5. Now we're going to look at these. This is a picture of the church with no discipleship. And I apologize to you if this message is boring, but this is an important message. Important message. A church with no discipleship does good, and then it gets the big head. And when the enemy changes tactics, it doesn't see it coming, nor can it stop it. When you have the big head, and when the church has a big head as a whole, it cannot stop the attacks that the adversary is bringing because now they have taken their eye off Christ and they've put their eye on themselves. They've put their eye on the mountain that they're on instead of the one who brought them to the top of the mountain. You see, the valleys ain't pretty, but when we're in the valleys, we're not looking at the valley. We're looking to somebody that can get us out of the valley. But a lot of times when we get on the mountain, there's nothing prettier than that mountain we're on. And we'll forget the one that brought us. And that's what happens here, and that's what will happen to this church. As you see people get saved, they need help. They need discipled. And what if I told you that that was your calling? It's not just your calling to lead them to Christ, but it's your calling to grow them in Christ. Amen. You know, we got football fans in here, I know, right? Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> I say you're playing in a football game. I'll try to put this in a way you can understand it. And you're on a team, and then you have an opposing team that is against you, okay? They cannot stop your defense. They cannot stop. There's nothing they can do. They can't score on you because your defense is so strong. So they can't attack your defense direct because they won't succeed. But there's other ways of attacking your defense that is not attacking your defense. When they're on defense, if they can stop your run game, now it takes longer to run the ball than it does to pass the ball. So if they can make your team one-dimensional on offense and take your run game out of the equation and force you to pass all the time, so now the enemy knows exactly what you're doing every play is passing because you can't now run the ball, which is taking a lot of time off the clock and giving your defense plenty of rest. So now all you can do is pass, and they know it's coming. So now they stop your pass, and you're three and out, and your defense has had 45 seconds to rest. So now they come back out, and your defense isn't as strong as it was. You see, it attacked your defense, but it didn't attack your defense directly. It attacked your offense so that it could get to your defense, and now they can score on you because your defense got weak. Now, what's the reason that the defense got weak? What's well, a deeper re reason? They had no depth. You got 11 men on the field and they get wore out. If you got 11 more uh, men just as good on the sideline, then this problem won't affect you. The remedy to this problem is death on your team. And if the church has no death, the adversary will eventually break it down. And that's what's happened when new Christians are being recruited or being reconciled and they're not being discipled, then they are not strong enough to fight this fight. So when all the ones that, that are truly uh, spiritually mature enough to handle the fight, when they get wore down, then the ones that we're not discipling, it's time for them to step up and they can't handle it. 
This is the importance of discipleship. So if the church has no debt, the adversary will break it down. And how does the church create debt in their church? Through discipleship. Through training, and I'm not talking about a Monday night discipleship training class. I'm talking about each and every one of you in here today helping your neighbor, helping the person beside of you, helping the person behind you, working together as a team so that these loads ain't on just a few people's backs, but they're on all of our backs. Effective discipleship. There's three points I'd like to make to an effective discipleship. One is the true gospel is being preached. That is number one. And we all know the true gospel, that we're saved by grace. And it's not a worse. You know, Jesus was uh, talking one time, and there was a Pharisee come in to pray. And man, he said a great prayer, and he looked good. He was doing all the right things. And then a tax collector come in that was a sinner. He was probably a horrible person. And he said, God, I'm nothing. Forgive me of my sins. I need you. And Jesus said that tax collector went home justified. But the Pharisee didn't. You see, a lot of times the church will get self-righteous, and it won't even know it. It'll get the big head because we're seeing results, because we've overcome some problems from, by looking to Christ. And then when we overcome those problems, we get the big head and we become self-righteous and we think that we've got it all going on. Amen. And then the adversary can come in and destroy us. But what's really happening, if you're in here today and you become self-righteous, is you really despise the gospel because it starts to hit your pride. Did you know that? You may not come out and say, I despise the gospel, but what you believe is contradicting the gospel itself. We don't like our pride to be hit, do we? And a lot of times when we are preaching the true gospel, or we are telling the true gospel that you are saved not by your works, but by God's grace, that Jesus Christ did it all on the cross, and He didn't leave you nothing to do, all you had to do was learn about Him, and He took care of that. And then you receive Him, and now you're saved. The true gospel is He did it all. He saved you, and He keeps you. In the Old Testament, they would offer sacrifices, and while the children of Israel was out doing nothing, the high priest was sprinkling the blood on the horns of the altar. Israel wasn't doing anything but trusting that the high priest was going to atone for their sins through the sprinkling of the blood. Christ's uh, blood is offered on the, the horns of the altar day and night for you. He's seated uh, at the right hand of the Father. He is keeping you. He is our high priest. Amen. He is eternal. All other high priests that Israel had are dead and gone. But he lives forever and he's forever keeping you. He does it all for you and that's the true gospel. And a lot of times we receive opposition when we teach the true gospel, don't we? Opposition. I remember when Paul, he preached the gospel uh, at Philippi and they beat him and they persecuted him and when he went to the next town which I think was uh, I think it was the Thessalonians did he change his gospel he preached the same one didn't he so effective discipleship we can't change the message even though we may receive opposition from it, even though somebody may come into church and say that ain't true, we know the truth, amen? And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by Him. No matter what kind of opposition that we receive, we keep preaching the true gospel. Number two uh, aspect of an effective discipleship is walk like you're saved. Not walk like you're saved to be saved, but you are now saved, so now walk like you're saved. And when you walk like you're saved, what you're really doing is teaching people to walk like they're saved. And a lot of times we don't walk like we're saved. So the new Christians that come in don't walk like they're saved until nobody in the church is walking like they're saved. So nobody in the community knows we're saved. So nobody else in the community gets saved. Does that make sense? Number three, having a heart to serve. 
When you have a heart to serve, what you're really doing is teaching the new converts to have a heart to serve. Because we know that we provoke one another to good works, right? So when I do a good work, it provokes you to do a good work. That's called discipleship. I remember when Sean Ward was pastor here and I come and I rededicated my life to God and I didn't know uh, from the front of the uh, church to the back. I didn't know which end of the church was by the road. I said, so dumb. But he was persistent with me because he knew I needed disciple. Me and him started hunting together and he called me several times asking me to go rifle hunting with him. And I wasn't into rifle hunting. I was into bow hunting. Hadn't picked up a rifle in years. And he kept calling me, won't you go rifle hunting with me? Won't you go rifle hunting with me? Won't you go rifle hunting with me? And then finally, you know, I was talking to Kim. I said, I believe I'll just go rifle hunting with you. You know, me and him hang out. So he called me right after I told Kim that. And he asked me again. I said, I just decided I was going with you. And from that moment on, we went and killed two, two deer together that day. From that moment on, me and him were the best of friends. And he discipled me. So now I'm able to be a pastor. And these new converts, if somebody don't go get them and put their arm around them and help them, they're not going to be able to be successful in their calling. You say, well, they don't need me. They need Jesus. Well, if I told you that Jesus decided to work through you, we need each other because Jesus is inside each and every one of us. So we have a responsibility to disciple these new converts because if we don't, the church will fall apart again. Now everyone has ministry gifts, and I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 4. Everyone has ministry gifts. This is Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now we ain't all pastors and we ain't all evangelists and we ain't all teachers, but we all have been given the ministry of reconciliation and we can all tell people about the true gospel. We can all walk Walk like we're saved, and we can all have a servant's heart. Amen. And when we do this, we are edifying the church. And when all these things are accomplished, then effective discipleship has taken place. And here's the result. You ready for the result of effective discipleship? It says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him all things which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body uh, may join together uh, and compacted by that which every joint supply according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. There's the picture of the church when it is uh, has effectual discipleship in it. What do you mean? If we don't disciple and if we don't take this responsibility serious, here's what happens. You ready? The church needs a bus driver, but the bus driver ain't there. The church needs some more teachers, but the teachers ain't there. Now, if you come to hear me hoop and holler and have a good time, today ain't the day. I'm just telling you the truth. Is that all right with you guys? Amen. If we don't disciple, somebody's going to have to preach when I'm sick. Somebody's going to have to teach when somebody else can't make it. And there's not going to be nobody there to do it. Somebody's going to have to be over children's church. Some of these places that, that, uh, that the, the elders of the church are, are, are taking up, the, uh, the colleagues that they have, eventually they're not going to be with us anymore. Fonzo's 93. How much longer will he go? You know, God may bless him to be 120. But still, if he passes away at 120, somebody has to replace him. And if we don't disciple, there'll be nobody there. Amen. 
No matter how good a time we're having in the Lord today, and no matter how many people get saved today, just because they're saved don't mean they're able to do the Lord's work. We have to disciple them so that the church can continue to grow and so that more people can become saved. Because if 100,000 people get saved today and they show up at Sydney and tomorrow they have no idea how to lead anybody else to Christ, then nobody else is going to get saved. You're stuck at 100,000. When there was another 100,000 out there that are dying and on their way to a devil's hell. We have a responsibility to disciple. As the Lord has blessed us to overcome the battles that the adversary has brought our way. And you're going to see the results from it. People are being saved and there's more people going to be saved. It's time that you wrap your arm around them and you help them. And you, under, you make sure that they understand that they're going to trip and fall. But you're there for them and you can help them uh, get up out of the mud. And matter of fact, you can tell them, hey, I've been where you are before and I know how to get out. And I looked to Jesus Christ and he pulled me out. And you can help them to accomplish the same things that God has blessed you to accomplish in this life. What was that Sean always said? Let her light shine and support her local church. What did he say? It was the most uh, patriotic and worldly good you could do. Let her light shine and support her local church. I think from now on I'm going to say it every Sunday like he did. Because I see how important that is. If we don't let our light shine and support our local church, the adversary will tear our church apart. So how do we let our light shine and we support our local church? You ready? We're going to make a full circle with this. You ready? Big old circle. I'm going to take you back to Revelation chapter 2. When Jesus was talking to the church of Ephesus. He told them, said, you've left your first love. And he said, because that you have left your first love, I'm going to remove your candlestick out of its place. Which means he's going to leave, or your church is not going to be in his presence. That means your church is not going to have power. Nobody there is going to let their light shine. Because they have no light within themselves. The only light that they have is what Christ shines through them. And how can they shine a light if Christ isn't first there? So this church wasn't letting their light shine and they wasn't supporting their local church because supporting a local church is more than financial even though financial support is a big deal. But supporting your church is discipling those that are in it. Supporting your church is taking those that was just saved or taking these children uh, that don't fully understand what's really going on and discipling them and getting them where they can stand on their own two feet and help somebody else. This is supporting your church and this is letting your light shine. And Christ said he was going to remove their candlestick out of its place if they didn't come back to their first love. So when the church leaves its first love, it loses its power because their first love is their power. So if this church ever leaves its first love, then there goes the power. There goes the saving grace. You're not going to lead anybody to Christ without Christ. So this gives Satan power to start destroying the church. Because he had no power when Christ was here. But when Christ is not here, then he can come in. He can come in. So the answer to keeping a church alive and powerful is if the congregation is in love with Christ. Full circle. We've got to be in love with Christ. And we have every reason to be. And the reason that new Christians will not fall in love with Christ is because they haven't been discipled. Because they haven't learned the truth about Christ. Because nobody has took them under their wing and help them like Sean Moore did for me. Because I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for God. And He used Sean Moore to do it. And He wants to use you to help somebody else. I'm reminded of Paul and Timothy. 
you know, where would Timothy have been without Paul? I'm confident God would have sent somebody else to help him. But he sent Paul. And Paul understood his responsibility and he discipled Timothy. And many times, you know, Timothy done some awesome things because of the discipleship that he had received from Paul. Because Paul understood his purpose. And today I want you to understand your purpose. And that is not just to lead people to Christ and be done with them, but to lead them to Christ and disciple them because the future of the church depends upon that. You may understand the truth, but what about the person that's coming in behind you? What about the person that's coming in behind you? So example of the church being in love with Jesus, these are some things that you'll see. It will love people, and it won't have divisions in it, but it'll have discipleship in it. Because when you're in love with Christ, you care about the things that He cares about. You know, when I fell in love with my wife, Kim, I wasn't big on, you know, dying hair. Because I don't have any. And I like the color of my beard. When I fell in love with Kim, I had no desire to go out and buy paint for fingernails. But she cares about those things, so I care about them. You know, I used to love Pekings, love Pekings. Since me and my wife have been married, I haven't eaten there but one time, and that's because she didn't go with us when we went and met the evangelist in Pipe. You know why? Because I want her to eat where she wants to eat. You know, ever since me and Kim's been married and she's been in love with me, she never cared about no West Virginia football game. But when West Virginia football's on, she goes over and sits by herself and she hushes till the game's over. <laughs> Not because I make her, because she loves me and she's in love with me and she knows that I care about watching West Virginia football, so she goes and does her own thing. And if you're in love with Christ today, you're going to care about the things that He cares about. And He cares about reconciling the world unto Himself. And when you care about reconciling the world, you will care about the local church and our community that is reconciling the community to Christ. And you will care that if there is people in the church that are spiritually immature, that, that you will help them to obtain maturity. You will disciple them. And not only will you benefit the church in that aspect, but we'll just go ahead and talk about it. You will financially support the church. And you won't financially support the church because you're trying to receive something from God. You will financially support the church because you love God. You love what He has done for you. And you love what He's doing with the church. And you love the people that the church can affect. So now, through falling in love with Jesus Christ, you can not only support your church by discipling people, but you can financially support them too. And there's a lot of new Christians in here that don't understand that their obligation to financially support the church. That's part of discipleship. If they never understand that they're supposed to do that and God wants them to do that, they'll never do it. Amen. You say, well, God provides the money for the church. He uses people to provide. And when you're not in love with Jesus Christ, then nobody supports the church in discipleship or financial aid. So all of a sudden the church has no power. And it wasn't because they went broke. It was because everybody wasn't in love with Jesus. And he removed the candlestick from his presence. It won't be in condemnation or self-righteousness. The church that is in love with Jesus won't have condemnation. And it won't have self-righteousness because it understands that we were nothing. But now we are something all because of Christ. Number three, it will endure the sufferings of this life with thanksgiving and joyfulness. If the congregation is in love with Christ, it will continue to grow and be successful in its ministry of reconciliation. So I'm going to close with this. Why are we in love with Jesus Christ? Why are you in love with Him today? Because He loved you first. 
And for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth Him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you're in here today and you are saved, you're saved by grace through faith and it's not of works lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God. And if you're in here and you're lost, He's done it all for you. And He's given you a free gift of salvation and all you have to do is receive it through a faith response. As the singers come,